morning. Oh no, it's not morning. It's afternoon. Afternoon! It is about quarter to three on Sunday afternoon and we're finally up here. The weather has been nuts. It's bright sunshine one minute and then black clouds come over and it's really dark and then absolutely torrential rain. But it isn't raining at the moment, so uh, we are up here. And once again, I arrive with a list a mile long, which there's no way I'm gonna get all the things done. And I'm not sure which ones I'm gonna prioritize. <laughs> I have got, actually, I know what I need to prioritize really is to lift the shallots. So last week you saw me, I lifted the garlic out. And for the same reason, I'm really worried about the shallots. I think they probably could have done with being in the ground a bit longer in a nice bit of dry sunshine. But because we're having this really humid weather and it's wet all the time, I think they're just going to rot out. So although they're not huge, not even large, <laughs> uh, I think I need to take them out. Otherwise, we're going to lose the whole lot. So that is the most important thing on my list today. So I might get that done first. The other thing I need to do is to feed the tomatoes and the peppers. So it's going to be a polytunnel and greenhouse feeding session. God, the temperature is just nuts. It's like... Obviously the sun's going in and out and it's raining and then it's sun and it's raining and it's sun and it's like jumper on, jumper off, jumper on, jumper off, like hair up, hair down, hair off. So yeah, feeding tomatoes, lifting the onions. If you watched my July sewing video last Thursday, was it last Thursday? Recently, July sewing video. I'm always alarmed when I do the like, you can sew this this month and I'm like, holy smog, I got a lot to sew. So yeah, basically I'm gonna be doing a lot of sewing, mainly lettuces got a lot of lettuces to sew and basically I better get on with it. Hmm? Okay let's go and have a look at these shallots. So like I was saying we lifted the garlic because we thought that they might be rotting out and I think some of these shallots are a little bit worse for wear as well which is a shame but the weather has just been so wet it's not really much you can do about it. So these are them, please ignore the weeds, but you can see like some of these have just completely like rotted off the end. So I will lift them and see what we've got. So way back in the mists of time when I planted these out, these were from sets. And at the time I had a bit of a whinge about how I didn't really understand the point of onion sets. I know a lot of people really like to grow onions from sets. That's absolutely fine, but I don't, really get the concept of you put a small onion in the ground and you get a bigger onion however many months later. It's a bit like putting a potato in the ground and only expecting to get one larger potato later in the year. Like, it just doesn't kind of sit well in my head. So I always grow any onions that I'm growing from seed. And I had assumed that shallots were exactly the same because I normally grow like banana shallots um, from seed. So things like zebrun and figaro. Unfortunately, I actually forgot to get any in this year, but somebody bought me some shallot sets and I was like, oh, well, I've got them now, I may as well put them in. And when I looked up in the book to see how I should be planting them, I realised that shallots are not like onions. They're more like potatoes. So you put one small shallot set in the ground and you get a whole clump of shallots from it. Uh, so... I completely take back all of the terrible things I said about shallot sets before I knew what was going on because I'm now a bit of a convert. I think they're wonderful. I'm still not convinced about onion sets though. I'm still not convinced about that. I'm not unhappy with that actually. I thought they were gonna be a lot worse. So I'm just gonna let these dry out and then we'll see what we've got. I tell you what, the smell of them is incredible. It's like knock you over. <laughs> oh, how I love to see a cabbage white butterfly inside the cabbage white butterfly netting. <laughs> it's meant to keep them off, not trap them in. But anyway, you know, these little butterflies are the main reason that we cover 
all of our brassicas and they there's two so they look pretty similar there is a large cabbage white and a small cabbage white and it's not the butterflies themselves that do the damage but the caterpillars will muller the brassicas so the large cabbage white are really easy to spot they do more damage more quickly but you can see them in an instant they're like yellowy lime greeny speckledy kind of colors and they're always in large groups so you spot them really really fast but the small cabbage white has a very very sneaky caterpillar which is like a velvety soft green color and they often line themselves up with the ribs of the leaves so you just can't see them like you don't spot them luckily i don't have any examples to show you just yet but i'm sure give it a couple of weeks and i'll be able to show you both types Okay, I better get this chap out of here. Oh, I think I can feel rain. Oh yeah, it is pretty dark up there. Still a bit of blue, but mostly dark. time to head in to the polytunnel just as it's about to rain things are looking pretty jungly in here so not only am I going to feed I'm also going to do a bit of tying in because you know I planted these really really close together in here this year because I've planted them so close together I've got to be really really careful about um, taking out the branching bits and keeping them tied in otherwise it would just be a madhouse so I'm probably going to do that first and then give them a bit of a prune so that everything's got enough space and then I'll get on with the feeding. Okay, you can really tell in here, like I planted these in three stages and they're all different heights, but these ones at the backs, which were the first ones I put in, are way taller and more covered in flowers than anything else. Like these guys, they're all at the top. Look, like that's the ceiling. Boop, boop, boop. Right up high. So these are the side shoots, which I'm just gonna take out on all of my plants. Uh, I've got enough tomatoes this year, but if you wanted to propagate more, you could just slice the end of that off clean, stick it in some compost, and Robert's your mother's brother, done. Basically, they root so easily, you won't have a problem. But I'm taking all of these out because uh, they just keep the plants really nice and tidy, and it focuses all the energy into producing tomatoes, which is the aim of the game, really, isn't it? Oh, sorry, this is a bit... I'm not very good at doing this one-handed. I'm going to put the camera down because I'm just mullering this. Uh, yeah, that wasn't tidy. But we've got loads of tomatoes on the go. These are the Brad's Atomic Grape that I am well excited about. And we've got various bits and bobs kind of coming along in here. Loads of smalls. I think that one's called Shimmer. So as well as taking off the side shoots, I'm just, as these are growing, I'm twisting them around the string. If you saw me planting them out, you know that they've got string buried underneath the root system. And now that they're so well established, that string's really held in tight at the bottom. And I'm just twisting the main stem of the tomato around the string as they grow up, which keeps them nice and straight. And as I'm working my way along, I'm also taking some of the foliage off the tomatoes, particularly from the bottom. I'm doing that for two reasons. Firstly, you wanna have really good airflow around the tomatoes because um, it helps with things like blight and any kind of mildew. But also because I've got chilies and peppers and aubergines growing below them, as these tomatoes grow, I'll defoliate them from the bottom so that they're kind of uh, just a long stem with no foliage on at the base, which will give more light and space to the chilies and the peppers and the basil and anything else I end up growing under here. So key to the string system is being able to tighten the strings and I have them tied at the top. So fixed at the top and then the dangly bits in the hole. Some people have the fixed bit in the bottom of the tomato and the dangly bits at the top. 
but that involves tying and re-tying from the top and later on in the season when the plants are really heavy and they've got a lot of fruit on them that can be quite cumbersome so i use a technique called windy stick <laughs> which is an old technique that we used to use for the bindings on molds so crossover from my other life step one take your little stick then where you've got quite a lot of give in the string take one of those little sticks they have to be quite skinny the sticks and pinch your thumb against both of the cords and then wind it under so you're making a little winch and then tie the stick to the string so I'm doing this just one twist for now because this is quite early on in the season but from that point now I can just undo that piece of string at the bottom and wind it further so every time I need to tighten them I just have to wind this stick up and it will tighten the string you do have to be quite careful that you don't over tighten it because it's only being held in at the bottom by the roots if you just keep winding you'll just pull it straight out of the root system but this really makes growing them up string so much easier. Oh yeah, the rain has started. I think it's only quite light, but it always sounds so heavy in here. Okie dokie, on to the feeding. So I would normally be feeding my tomato plants with comfrey tea, like homemade stuff. But my comfrey plants are not really at that stage yet. I used to have them all in a really big pot. Earlier in the year, I turfed them out of the pot and split them all up and dotted them all over the place. But it does mean that the plants themselves need a bit of time to kind of settle in and recover. So I don't have harvestable comfrey at the moment. So what I'm using instead is an organic liquid seaweed feed and I'm really happy with this. It's from a company called Shropshire Seaweed. Originally they sent me some free liquid seaweed to try and I was really happy with it but what I was most happy about is that locally to me there is a refill centre so you don't have to buy a new bottle every time. I can just nip over to Teddington and refill my bottle which is a massive plus point for me. So seaweed is a really fantastic fertiliser. It's been used for, well, I would say centuries, but probably millennia around coastal areas as a soil improver and fertiliser for crops and all sorts of things. It's really fantastic because it's really strong in all like the big areas you want. It's got the phosphate and potassium and nitrogen, but it's also got masses and masses of the trace elements that so many other fertilisers are missing. It's also, you can use it as a water on feed, you can use it as a foliar feed. You know how much I love comfrey feed, but I'm gonna use a mixture of both, partly because my comfrey plants are so small at the moment, they're not really gonna be able to be harvested on the scale that I would need to make enough feed to be feeding everything for the whole year. So I'm gonna be using a mixture of this seaweed feed and my comfrey probably for the rest of the summer.
couple of weeks ago, we had some of the vegetable New Horizon peat-free. And this is the not vegetable one. I don't know why it was specifically for vegetables, but that was the only one they had. This time it's just the bog standard one. But last lot I had was really, really woolly. And I, this is the same. So I'm going to be using it for sowing seed into today because this is all we've got. But it's not good. Like, that is really rough for seed sowing. I think it's going to be all right. But, yeah, normally this is not, this is not the kind of texture you would want to sow seeds into. Perfect for bigger plants, like more established plants just potting up but not seed sowing. But I don't have a choice, so I am gonna go with it. I've mixed a good amount of vermiculite into it, so that should help. First thing I'm gonna sow is a load of lettuces. If you watched my What to Sow in July video, you'll know I'm not short of a lettuce variety, and I'm gonna get a whole load of them in today. I'm gonna to be reeling these lettuces off, so I will put a full list of all of the varieties I'm talking about and a link if I know where you can get them from underneath in the description. There is one addition to the lettuces that wasn't mentioned in the July one, and that is Webb's Wonderful. One of the things I really didn't need in my life was more lettuce seed. But when I went to buy this compost, this was calling to me from the seed rack, and it's got the rather bold claim written on it of Britain's best loved lettuce. So I just didn't feel I could leave the shop without it. So I've got an extra lettuce to sow. That means the ones that I'm sowing, other than Webb's Wonderful, which is an iceberg type, I'm sowing Valmain. And Valmain is a really gorgeous cut and come again cost lettuce. It is sweet and crisp and really, really reliable grower. I grow that one every single year. I'm also growing a proper classic Little Gem, which is a much more hearting lettuce. Just, uh, just a joy. It's a really, really lovely small lettuce. I am doing Rossa di Trento which is a Frankie's Seeds Italian lettuce. It is a glorious thing. It's a big bubbly headed, frilly, but crunchy type of lettuce with like a rich green and a little bit of red flashing on it. It is sweet and tender and wonderful. The other two lettuces I'm doing, one of them is a bitter frizzy lettuce, which is called Gold Heart. This is another one that we grow every year it will last the winter, so it's really, really handy to have in. We'll put one in now and we'll do another load of quite a few of these, but this one in particular around September time, and then that will be good lettuce for the whole of the winter. It's a bitter, bitter lettuce, but I can tell you with balsamic vinegar and pine nuts all over it. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Another one I'm doing is a dragon's tongue mild mustard. So it has a really beautiful kind of speckled, deep, rich purple leaf, which looks fantastic in salad. It's got that really peppery mustard flavor, but without blowing your head off. Sometimes the mustard greens, I find if you put them in a salad, that's all you can taste. Whereas this one, it's quite mild, but it's still got that flavor. Okay, so that is eight varieties of lettuce sown and two types of spring onion. Uh, we're not short of a spring onion up here at the moment, but they are going to all come to an end at the same time. Uh, well, in two waves at least. So that is going to keep us covered for the end of the summer. Next thing I'm going to do is replacement herbs. So I've got the two basils, which is the Thai basil and the uh, Genovese basil. I'm going to sow some more of them so that when the ones that are currently in the polytunnel tire themselves out, I've got something to put in their place. I'm going to do a bit more parsley. I've got flat leaf and curly. The curly is Lisette again, which is just my favourite variety. I'm going to do a bit more dill because our dill has all gone to seed and I'm also going to do some chives. This was a freebie packet of chives and there's about five chive seeds in it. So I'm gonna put them all in one pot together rather than spacing them out and get a bit of a clump going. But yeah, carry on, I suppose. Thank you. 
find a spot. Yeah. Well, we were just thinking about heading off after all that blustering and blowing and rain and everything. And now the sun's come out and it's gorgeous. Now I don't know whether to go home or not. I might pick some peas, I think. Oh, it is still a bit windy. I'll just take you in the shed. But, so I might pick some peas, but the, um, or monge too, more to the point, because the first wave of peas that we grew, uh, which were the Hurst's green shaft, they're pretty much come to an end now. Uh, there's still probably another bit of a picking on them, but it, they're not completely like covered. But the monge too is. And with all of these things, legumes, if you don't pick them, they just completely stop producing. Even if you do pick them, they do stop producing at some point, like the peas. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna go and pick the monge too. And uh, maybe have that for dinner.
plenty mange too. Some of these are a bit gnarly. Ooh, slippery too. See how they shouldn't be like that. But this particular variety, actually, some monge too, they do get really quite almost inedible and stringy if they're left on there too long, but these aren't too bad. Pick some Thai basil and do them in a stir fry. Just the Thai basil, these and some spring onions. Thai basil's been a bit mullered by the snails. That's a nice leaf, but other than that, uh, yeah. Snails love it, apparently. Didn't think they would, but they do. When picking this, it's just a case of pinching out the whole of the top section rather than taking individual leaves because that gives you, in the end, really nice, bushy, bulky plants. But look at those. Some of those leaves, there's hardly anything there. And there's holes in everything at the moment. Now, I know that this has been the ideal weather for slugs and snails, but come on now. <laughs> Getting a little bit fed up of the slugs and snails, to be honest. Right, plonk that in there and then the other thing I need is some spring onions. These are the Lilia. You know how I feel about Lilia spring onions. They are the finest. Uh, these are really, really tiny, but I'm going to use this as an opportunity to take out the biggest ones and leave a bit of space for the others to bulk up. And luckily, the ground is so sodden at the moment that uh, they just pull out without disturbing any of their friends. So, yeah, they come out really easily. And these are really tiny, but they will be super sweet and super delicious. Look at that colour. Obviously, I haven't taken the skins off these yet, and they're a bit filthy, but mm, mm, pink. And the tops look perfect, too. Okay, that's us done. Um, just as the sun, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful up here now, but uh, it is time to go and I feel a gin and tonic. The siren song of a gin and tonic is calling me. So we're gonna head off, see you at home. Well, wind swept and rained on and all the rest of it, but I do now have a gin and tonic. Which is a wonderful thing. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with this weather. The thing that I'm finding really difficult is not just the rain, but it's the slugs. They're just, it's just like a nightmare uprising of slugs this year. Like 2020 is going to be remembered for obvious reasons. 2021, I feel, is going to be remembered for slugs. And snails. But something that we haven't had an enormous problem with, touch wood, touch everything, is black fly. So this time last year, we just like, everything was covered in black fly. This year, everything's covered in slugs. I feel like slugs do more immediate damage, but you know, that is the way of things. I'm still, I've still got my fingers crossed for a really fantastic, like, bum end of the summer. I'm hoping so, come on. Like, it's, it's gotta be a really good summer. It just has to be. After the terrible year, it has to be a good summer. Again, it's just the one, it was just the one day up at the allotment filming this week. Uh, we got quite a lot of other things done on some other days, but when it's really, really raining outside, it's basically impossible to film because like, the camera gets wet. Well, I say the camera, <laughs> that's a bit fancy. The phone gets wet and it's just, it becomes really impractical. And when it's in really, really windy, like I can't keep the camera up. And so we did do a couple of other bits and pieces. Uh, we've sown quite a lot of direct sown stuff. So some of the celeriac we've direct sown straight in the ground. So I mentioned it uh, a couple of vlogs ago that I'm trying to get into the habit of not only putting the name of the variety that I'm talking about on the screen, but I'm also trying to get them listed in the blurb underneath. So if you're interested in any of the varieties, particularly that like that plethora of lettuces that I was sowing earlier today, they're all listed underneath in the text. That's the new thing. I'm trying to get into the habit of getting all of that information into the notes below. But yeah, talking of sowing stuff, uh, we sowed beetroot, this is all the direct sowing stuff, we sowed the beetroot, the celeriac, we've put some more turnips in, we've done, we've done some more radishes. Unfortunately, this is not going to be a great year for parsnips for us, uh, we've only got about six, <laughs> because um, we had a double whammy of the first lot that I got in that I filmed sowing them. Uh, we had quite poor germination, which is not unusual for parsnips, but 
uh, what did come up was then initially taken off by the chickens, like just completely everything was just taken off. And then, so it was only like the stragglers, the, the later germinating ones that kind of came up at all. We counted them and we had about mm, 25, I would have said. And then the slugs got what was left of them, just took them straight off at the top. So we have about five parsnips for this year. So I'm hoping later in the year we're going to be able to play swaps with somebody else who's got excess parsnips because five parsnips is not enough. We did then sow some more actually um, when we realised that it wasn't a goer, what we already had in. We did sow some more but we've had no germination on that and I think if anything did germinate it's just been taken off by slugs. So yeah peas are coming to an end. Uh, we've got the second wave of peas coming, but what is quite interesting is that the peas that we've had so far this year have had no pea moth in them at all, apart from the last picking of the green, of the Hurst green shaft, sorry. A um, couple of them had the little maggoty bits in them. So I'm fearing that the second wave of peas that we've got coming, by the time they actually come to be producing peas, I fear that the pea moth is going to be rife. So, I mean, we wait and see. They're quite a way off producing any peas yet. But um, first lot, got away with it. No problem. Second lot, bit iffy. Um, and as the peas are tailing out, we're starting to get a lot of flowers on the beans. Obviously, you know, we planted our beans out really quite late this year. Well, everything's late this year, but planted them out really quite late. And the ones that are on the main central drag are doing fantastically well they're like basically up to the top of the arches now but the ones along the side really really were i'm going to mention slugs again sorry really were got by slugs and snails early on when we first put them out because they are on the edge of the plot and the guy on the other side of our fence like our plot neighbor is trying to suppress because he's got a bit of a weed problem on that edge and he's trying to suppress his weeds by using black plastic which is doing a fantastic job for the weeds but obviously it provides a lot of like perfect environment hidey spaces for the slugs so what was happening is because that's on that edge and we had planted our beans across that edge it was just basically like easy access buffet for them but they've they the beans have now recovered and they are kind of outgrowing that initial damage so that's all really good so hopefully 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 we are going to have beans soon because beans are a joy anyway i think i've probably nattered on enough and I will uh, see you on Thursday and then again next Tuesday for a vlog. When you see me next on a vlog, I will be an unemployed person again. Cheers, chaps.